if you can build it here, you can build it anywhere. I think I'm just going to say that if you don't like something, change it. Okay, if I build one on wheels, you know, what are my hurdles? If I build one without wheels, what are my hurdles? What's local code requirement going to uh, drive me towards? You could be 60 years old yeah. uh, and you want to move your parents into an, an accessory dwelling unit. They have to go over the same hurdles as a 20-year-old that's, exactly. that doesn't want to have the lifestyle. But we need our safe secure places that someone can actually afford to live inside of. And this is a recurring theme of we're not going to let you do it. You want a different lifestyle? It's not a tiny house podcast. Our podcast, much as like our, our project that we were just over to see, it's in early phase, right? Like we're building through it. And, and you said something when we were we were picking up breakfast tacos and donuts. Um, what was it that you said about our project? You'd mentioned something about this one being... You guys have put so much thought into this. You know, we have a lot of people that call us all the time, and you know, with great intentions, of course. They want to do really cool things. They have great ideas. You know, it's with a lot of projects. People call us and have, hey, I want to do this and that and that. And, you know, sounds like that's kind of what you guys did at the beginning. Like, had a great idea, but the difference is you guys have gone through so far with it. Mm-hmm. And you've done so many things since then. There's a ton of pro- work. Yeah, you've done the work. But we also, I think we've brought this up several times as we do everything backwards. So we're everybody else, and we're learning that it's not necessarily the best way to go, but it's a way that forces you to do it. So now we're trying to learn how to do it the right way, and that's why you're here. So we because have to reverse engineer what something should have already been engineered, right? Like we, we go, we started at the end. We literally built a structure, and then we're like, we got to do we gotta do what? We got to go backwards from here. Yep. Now um, you have to learn everything. Now you have to learn, okay, we need a foundation. There, What's a floodway? So yeah. there's a million things you have to learn now because you have a building. Yeah. Instead of, I have dirt, what's the first step? Because yeah. mm-hmm. that's where I think a lot of people also get stuck. Well, and, and that's what happens, right? People get defeated. And what does it say on the top? Doubt kills more dreams than failure does, right? When you start by going, I'm betting the house on, th- on this first. If your first bet is everything in your wallet, you can't doubt it anymore. You have to at least fail at that point to no longer be able to move forward. And when you don't, you lose the idea that doubt is what's going to dictate how this moves forward. Only the belief that you can actually accomplish it will. But you got you to gotta, like, put something on the table first, right? And so... Like as we kind of talk about this, and I've I made a Facebook post not that long ago, and there was a, and this is kind of funny. There was actually a basketball coach that did not coach me. I was not a basketball player back home. He was a basketball coach at the time, and he said he liked it because I took a photo, probably like I think everybody does when they come over to our project over there. I took a photo and I posted it, and I said the idea didn't get it this far. Only the work did. Action. Right. And so there's a lot of cool analogies people use, like a ton of a ton of theory is worth an ounce of action or however you want to put it. You have to do something. And for me, you have to do something off paper. You have to bring something into the world to go, oh, OK, I didn't quite see that problem around that corner. Um, but again, I'm invested in this because I made that decision consciously to kind of move forward now. You can obviously see on our board, we give ourselves a little rough outline. And now this is what I'm talking about. We have warmed up, right? So Sage will find a way to cut into this conversation at some point and, and we get to move forward. But who we're, who we're sitting here with today is Alex with Three Rock Engineering. And you guys have an engineering firm that now is growing. What exactly, let's start with what exactly it is that you guys are currently offering. Um, and where you see your offerings continuing on from there. Maybe let's let's start there um, because today's discussion is going to start with civil engineering. Yeah. That's awesome. what you are, right? Yep. Yeah, cool. so I'm a civil engineer. Basically means I'm afraid of buildings. Um, <laughs> I like dirt. Yeah, sure. I like yeah, <laughs> ground down. Yeah, you know, okay. the, the joke is always that um, mechanical engineers, they make the weapons. Civil engineers make the targets. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is that the title? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's great. And, and so, okay. So, so three rocks engineering. What we do is, um, you know, always creating, on target. Yeah. <laughs> always on target. That's our new tagline yeah. for the company. I oh, love man. it. Always the target. Always the target. Yeah. <laughs> Those, not the same. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, anyway. Okay. So we do, you know, to sum it up, it's grading drainage utilities. So a nice new neighborhood comes in, surveyor goes out, collects topo, and you know where all the existing stuff is. We take that 
then we figure out, okay, here's where the roads are going to go. Here's, you know, what that road's going to look like in that section, how much concrete and base. Then, you know, you figure out, okay, what are the utilities we need? How are we going to get there? What's available right now? Mm -hmm. So utilities, let's, let's even break Mm -hmm. that one down. You say topo topography, Yep. right? So this is what the ground that you're talking about looks like. Mm Mm-hmm based on its elevations. Yep. Um, and so people can kind of think of it like if you've seen any maps through the military, the, they're the maps that have little rings on them, mm-hmm. right, that show everybody where, because they're not on site, where the slopes of these actual places fall. And that means for water drainage um, and also for the depths of any of your utilities that you mentioned, like gas, yep. septic, sewer, water, etc. It all gets buried where is it going to get buried? At what depth is it going to get buried? Can you drain from your house that's on the lower portion of the hill to the upper? Probably going to be difficult. Um, you know, like those kind of things, right? Yep, definitely. Cool. Yeah. So you're giving everybody the map from the ground down, as you mm-hmm. say. It's all the stuff that's important that you really like when it works, but you mm-hmm. don't think about yep. until it doesn't work. Yep. It's that kind of stuff. Right. So, yeah, like, you know, you're talking about drainage. Water only goes downhill unless it's towards money and power. Right. Um, <laughs> So, you know, well, like we, <laughs> we kind of learned that that money does make water go somewhere else. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a map that says you're in a floodway. Mm-hmm. You pay a surveyor yep. to actually come out and do a, a, a current survey. Yep. Turns out you're not. Yeah. Money moves water. That, that was our <laughs> that was great. our joke. Yeah. But in reality, it seems like you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. FEMA came through or comes through and they kind of throw a bigger blanket than they need to. Until somebody else comes along and goes, yeah, but could I build here? And then it's your responsibility to resurvey that and go, oh, actually, it's fine. But they were being overly cautious. Yeah. So that happens a lot, especially with older stuff. You know, nowadays we have LIDAR and, you know, they take a lot better information. They're able to get a lot tighter flood planes and floodways in there. So it's done. We have, you know, basically because computers have come so far that we're able to model it a lot more accurately. But like a lot of the models are still out there in our county from the 80s that, you know, it's just like this huge map. It's like, well, I can tell you for a fact that's definitely not accurate. I um, mean, it's really? pretty obvious, but it's because they're trying to do these big models off of old data that's not as good as mm-hmm. it is now. So, can you shoot stuff um, from satellites now, where like you could you could pick a parcel, know the the Tyler number, the or the assessor number, look it up, and and get an actual um, like basic topography there, or do you have to still send a surveyor out for everything? So. Usually we, you know, send a surveyor out, they go out with their stick and they collect all of it, right? Mm-hmm. The next step, um, it's a little less accurate, but it's come a t- really far away is LIDAR. LIDAR, so, okay. Yeah. That, um, and that's off airplanes? So it can be off airplanes, off drones. Usually it's off airplanes. Um, you know, they shoot out a million lasers out cool. and it collects all this information. You get a really dense point cloud and that turns into topography. So like in Fremont County, we have the benefit in that there's a good amount of topo available from Fremont County based on LIDAR. Not as good as on the ground surveying. It's okay. going to have a little a few kinks here and there. You can't trust it quite as much, but it's really good information to work off of. Especially for basics. Like if, can I even build here or do I, yeah. you know, do I just need to throw this idea away entirely yep. and move to the neighborhood lot over there? Yeah. And like, you know, a lot of times we have to do drainage reports all the time, right? Okay. For drainage reports, it's awesome really good data that we're able to use. Um, Mm -hmm. What kind of parameters are we talking about? Are we talking within uh, 12 inches, within 40 inches? You know, like what's what's LIDAR is kind of contours. So kind of the rule of thumb is that it's accurate with one, one foot. Okay. So plus or minus a foot is usually. Dude, shooting it from an airplane inside of a foot. Sorry. Well, we have somebody locally who does it with a drone. He does a drone. Yeah. Yeah. And does that. Dr. Luke. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Luke, he uses photogrammetry. His stuff is awesome. There's a lot of people. Well, there aren't a lot. There's different people out there that use photogrammetry in order to do it. Okay. It's not as accurate as LIDAR, but the way that Luke does it, he really tightens it down. Okay. Um, He makes sure that it's really spot on and accurate. So he's able to get a lot of really good data for a much lower price than it would be to get lower, to get LIDAR or to, you know, send out a surveyor. So a surveyor, right? This is the, when you guys are ever driving down the road, you'll see a dude standing there with a stick. It's like a measuring stick. And another guy (laughs) looking, I mean, looking through binoculars at the measuring stick. And he's looking through, another guy's looking at it through a tripod. Uh, from a, a distance away. I mean, this is like the total layman's way of kind of explaining what you're looking at, right? And they're shooting elevations to make sure that they have an accurate sheet of grid paper understanding, if you will, for when you're going to start dropping buildings or doing roads or doing drainage and doing these kind of things. Yeah? Yeah. Yep, definitely. Do you, 
as far as uh, what I just said and how you'd like to kind of course correct my very simplistic version of that, what do you got for survey? Like w- what, what did I miss on? Um, do they have a particular set of trousers that they always wear <laughs> or, or like, I mean, like you can uh-huh. crank the knob yeah. a little bit. Cause this is, this is your, your area. I'm just like, I look at people like they have like a little Lego outfit yeah. on and I'm like, that's the survey guy. Yeah. So survey is super important because you want a good survey because otherwise, you know, everything we do is based off a survey basically. So we send out the surveyor, he goes, collects the data, and then, you know, all of our design is off based off of that. So if the surveyor didn't do a good job, you have a grade break or grade bust. Um, and then you have to, you know, redesign or depends on how bad it is, but you have issues, right? So what you're talking about, that's definitely how they do surveying. Um, but nowadays, you know, they, it's a little more advanced. Usually it's one guy nowadays, um, yeah. you know, maybe two like and John. they have a collector yeah. and, um, data collector and everything's basically connected to satellites usually. Okay. usually so the they, data collector is like a, a set point. I think he tried to explain this to me when we had our surveyor out. Right. There's a set point. He's got a tripod there with a, a satellite something connection. Yeah. And so, then he walks around with his stick that records the data yeah so there's a few different ways to do it but you know usually you send a monument first where you say like okay right here um, you might run what's called an opus solution in order to figure out you know what vertical datum you're on or what data so is this like setting a home um like a from this point everything's rel- uh, relative from this point yeah so you might make your own monument and create your own little coordinate system but usually we try to you know make it relevant to the rest of the world what and what mm-hmm. drives that decision on where that monument would go would that be where a building's going to be on that particular parcel and everything's relative to that or like what would drive mm-hmm. that decision yeah so the goal is to be close enough that you know you can shoot everything off of that point but far enough away that you're not going to rip it out of the ground Got you know, it. you're not gonna have some guy run over it with a tractor you're not gonna <laughs> you know put it exactly yeah. where this pipe is gonna go and you're gonna have to dig it up and reset a new one okay yeah okay that makes sense yeah. so somewhere you can see the entire plot um without having a major issue yeah and a lot of times you want to set two or three um so that way you know if one gets wiped out and so you can make sure to get you know what's my angle on this how do i rotate it to triangulate back to exactly. getting your third point back Exactly. Kind of like how cell phone towers operate when they're locating yeah. a cell phone. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So, I mean, that kind of helps us understand s- some of the civil engineering stuff. Now, there are other projects like when we're going to drop a structure where for, say, a foundation, you guys have to have different bits of information. Or for a septic yeah. tank, you have to know uh, like a soil test for absorption of um of water um, or of compaction for a foundation, those kind of things. Yeah. What's that process look like? Definitely. So um, I, you know, civil engineer, afraid of buildings. So I have awesome structural engineers that I work with right. and we have on our team. Um, so they design the foundation. First step in designing foundation is we go out and we get a geotech report. You right. can do it sometimes without getting a geotech report, but basically the engineer is going to over-design it. You're going to spend more on concrete and construction in order to actually get it built. So we send out a geotech engineer. They drill a couple bores and they say, okay, it's, you know, like silty clay for the first five feet and then it's sand after that or then you hit bedrock after 20 feet or something like that. Um, so they come up with this great report, tell us what we need to know. They give recommendations on the foundation. If there's anything weird, um, about the soils, they look at that. So the main, one of the main things we're looking in there is the bearing capacity of the soil. And, um, you know, then we go and do our work, design the foundation. We load track through the house, figure out how heavy the house is, figure out what the soil can do. Then we just figure out that middle piece like you were talking about earlier. Cool. So something weird. Um, if there was ever uh, dirty fill brought in or if there was maybe a uh, landfill somewhere. I mean, those would be weird. Those would be weird. To me. Or, yeah. To me. No, <laughs> What's weird to you? Yeah. So one of the weirdest things, I haven't worked on a project with this, but um, where I used to live, there's a whole neighborhood that got built. Really nice new houses. You know, they're at least half a million. Nowadays, they sell for a million. But <laughs> right. they uh, built it in this nice neighborhood but they only got a few soil samples and they missed big chunks of area what they didn't know is there's what's called evaporative soils in there which i don't know everything behind evaporative soils by any means but basically what it is is when it gets wet all of a sudden the soil disappears and so you have all these walls on the basement just like leaning out from the house pulling away from the house because <laughs> the, the structure on top is pushing them out now yeah because it's pushing them out and the soil behind the is just not holding anything yeah 
Yeah. Evaporative soils. So yes. I didn't even know that that was a word. Soil that yeah. evaporates. Yeah, just, I mean, I get oof. it. It sounds <laughs> like sub. It sounds like uh, like sublimation soil, right? Like it goes <laughs> it goes from from gas to solid or from solid to gas. Solid to gas. Yeah. yeah I mean, right. Wouldn't so, that be sublimation? Yeah. It's just that's gone. So right. that's a weird thing. That's you know why we try to get geotech. So that that's way awesome. they can figure that out beforehand, and you know you don't invest half a million dollars or however much in a house, and then you know. So, so for on. no personal reason whatsoever, um, <laughs> do you deal with, do you deal with uh, designing foundations in, um, a floodplain? Oh yeah. Because half of Florence at least is in a floodplain. Yeah. Right. So we just did one, um, for your buddy, Justin. Um, yep. yeah. And so we just did a floodplain one there. And one of the tricks with that is you got to get all the elevations just right. And you have to have a certain amount of openings around the side. Right. So you have to have uh, one inch of one square inch of opening for every square foot of uh, area inside of your crawl space. Um, so which, so uh, the water can flow through? Exactly. So you're not damming up the Exactly. The you're, yeah. n- you're not damming up, but more importantly, you're trying to prevent the hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. Um, so if you get it's going to move water, your building or yeah. it's going to crumble. Well, it's whole, just going to like okay. push it all yeah. in. Right? It's going to fuck the whole so, thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, what you, yeah. <laughs> that's what you tip your kayak in white water and get pinned against uh, yeah, yeah. a log. Cool. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys have to understand something about that. fluid dynamics when it comes to that kind of stuff, or at least or at least – build inside of the parameter that says this is what the code read it said i have to create a foundation that has one square inch of opening for every one square foot of of crawl space and also has to meet a compaction standard for what the house load calculation is on top of it right yeah and so with that one square inch of opening you know nice thing about being an engineer we has we have a little bit of liberty to um, do what we call engineering judgment and we can, you know, kind of work around that a little bit as long as we can justify it. And, mm-hmm. you know, if there's the, like the water would be coming from this direction and moving in this direction. And so that's why we put more on this side of the house than on this side of the house. A little bit of that. And a lot okay. of it, too, is instead of one square inch per square foot, we can use engineered openings and we can calculate other openings that'll basically reduce how much how many vents you have to have on the outside. Got it. Because if you start looking at eight, you know let's say a thousand square foot and you know, that's a thousand square inches of opening. That's a ton that's a of That's a huge opening. opening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. Now you're almost on piers. Everywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're able to use engineered openings, which makes it a lot more reasonable. Okay. So to help everybody who's not inside of, of what we talk about every day, right? Um, like a, a physical therapist goes through a board exam and becomes uh, awarded their, their ability to practice in that state. So an engineer similar ish i mean so there's a test that you guys take and you're awarded your state stamp yeah. seal right so yeah there's a few different ways to get it but the typical route is that you you know go to college for four years get your bs and then you work under another professional engineer or pe for four years and then you go and sit for a test well first after the college you first sit for your fe fundamentals of engineering exam and then you get your engineer in training or engineer intern certification um so when you have that, then you work under a PE for four years, and then you set for a really big test, so that professional engineering exam. And then if you pass and you have all the right um, experience and everything, then the state says, great, here you go, here's your PE number. Right. And you get a stamp, um, and then, yeah, then you can go ahead and certify things. So certain things need certification, um, whether it's by the state or county or city, like uh, foundation design. Usually you need a PE to stamp it. Right. Um, and that's a practicing engineer. Yeah. Yeah. So, and is that stamp for the state at the state level or is that federal? For a foundation, that would be for, um, per the code, I believe, per the IRC. What I'm saying, like the, the fact that you can stamp something that, so. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I would stamp is for state of Colorado. I'm licensed okay. in the state of Colorado. You have to so get licensed I, in mm-hmm. different states. Yeah. So if, if I wanted to go okay. stamp something in Texas, um, you know, I'd have to go and transfer my license over there. Different states have different regulations. Like in Texas, you have to take an ethics exam in order to get your PE. In California, you have to, I think you have another exam you have to take there. There's different, mm-hmm. some states are easier to transfer to than other states. Are there reciprocities where, um, like when, when you're going to college, I know when I, when you could go to a bordering state for mm-hmm. in-state tuition from yeah. the state that you were in. Like, is there any kind of a state reciprocity for engineering that you know of? No, you still have to transfer it. So Okay. And yeah. there's only one state at a time then? So you can't yep. do multiple? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that'd be sweet. But yeah, state of residence, kind of, is that how they dictate that? Or no, it's wherever you apply for it. So, okay. you know, I took my PE in Colorado and applied for my PE in Colorado. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. So now I have my number. And so um, now that we're kind of like figuring out where, who, 
why, what, when, all of that fun stuff. Um, currently, what we're experiencing here, at least in Colorado, and I think it's relatively nationwide, is going to be um, this super high sticker price for a lot of housing, yeah. construction costs. Are you watching a trend in in any of what you're seeing? Are you seeing square footages drop? Are you seeing more interest or, or questioning coming from tiny housing or smaller housing or anything like that? Or, or is that something that we're kind of still uh, kind of bridging the gap back to reality with for people? I'm just kind of curious if you're getting those calls or questions from anybody about what would it look like to do a small foundation for a small house because it says I can't have a tiny house on wheels. Um, anything like that? We do get a few calls from people wanting to build, you know, a really small cabin or um, sometime on a rare occasion, a really small house. Um, we had one person come to us that wanted to do a tiny house development. They wanted to do it on wheels. But, yeah, we do get a few people that want a small cabin or whatever um, on really small stuff. You know, when you're talking about one room, 400 square foot cabin, you know, sometimes we got to think about it and say, like, okay, well, is it worth us? going through all of these processes and, you know, charging whatever we're going to charge, or is it better to, you know, kind of make some assumptions and it's actually going to be cheaper to overbuild just a little bit because it's such a small. Right. Build. So you're looking, um, basically looking like, well, this house can only weigh so much and even the trashiest soil is, is only going to, is going to give a compaction of, of this at the very, very least. So you just overdo the foundation take some liberties there and go, hey, let's add an extra couple yards of concrete or, or whatever it may be. Um, and it's obviously never going to hurt um, to overbuild an engineer that way. But there's like, so there's a, there's a sliding scale of when this is actually, when we start talking about smaller and smaller and smaller of where civil maybe is um, going to actually affect any tiny uh, 200 square foot structure on an acre lot. Um, there's not a lot of square footage there that's obviously be taken up by structure. So it affects things a little bit less in your guys' world from a civil standpoint. Yeah. So our goal is from all of engineering is to do our best to balance all the cost of construction and design um, and try to, you know, give everybody the best product and best bang for their buck. And, um, and only just because I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, Barna asked me to add onto the board and he needs to talk more about this one because uh, it's happened more recently for him. Yesterday. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Yesterday, um, today, it's still happening. It's, still right it's currently, we're in the middle of it. Theory versus reality, right? So um, on the board, I have a couple of things. The excavator likes to bring it up. Yeah, it's all good unless I hit a, you know, a rock the size of a Volkswagen. How, uh, any cool stories on like having to pivot around that? What about bad locates where um, the line where they, because what happens when before you're going to dig, you call in a site locate and they come in and they, you know, if there is water or gas or whatever, they paint the lines on the ground and they give them a little bit of like, what did it say, within three feet of this kind of uh, for your digging. So, you know, this, you guys have heard the 811. Call 811 before you dig. This is all really important. And then adapting on site, reengineering things because all of a sudden you found evaporative soil or fucking whatever was laying inside of that particular. Yeah, my, my question is a little bit more concrete. So, you did the feasibility yeah. study for the larger lot I've got yeah. in South Union. And it's like, yeah, 90 whatever percent. Sure, we can build it. What happens when <laughs> you have bad data from somebody else, right? We have to go under a railroad. You have to go under a ditch. You have to go over a ditch, yeah. another one, another ditch company. And what if that information is not correct? And that doesn't even get into what if you hit a granite huge boulder halfway through when you're already paying somebody to start trenching? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, there's always stuff, there's always unknowns. You don't know exactly how much a project's going to cost. You don't know exactly how it's going to be built until it's built in the ground, done, all the bills have been paid. So whatever the project is, there's always a few unknowns. And the whole goal is to get good data up front and engineer it as well as possible to remove as many of those unknowns as possible. Um, so that way construction is smooth, cost effective. Um, but yeah, whenever we, you know, are designing something, they might go out and be like, you know, find out. Um, hey, we hit this giant layer of shale, you know, two foot down, and he said to dig four foot down. What do we do? So, for example, there's a big mobile home park we worked on in Florence where they wanted the whole site graded, um, however many acres it was. It was you know, was mass it 17 acres? Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. It was something like 14, 17. I don't know. I think it was 14. So, right? yeah. Way, man, so you're it was like about 43,000 <laughs> square feet an acre, something like that. 
Does that sound five thousand two hundred? Or I had, so I had a way. I was way up with one acre. Square footage per acre is only. Oh, 52,420? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. No, we're good. So 50-some thousand. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, it's a lot. I, I was low, <laughs> and it was high in my head, right? So think about grading. This means, like, taking a giant tractor and making sure everything's kind of on plane for 500-and-some-odd thousand square feet at 10 acres. Yeah. So this was about... This, is bigger than this was something around 30,000 cubic yards. <laughs> Um, so it was a big chunk of dirt. Fucking, how big is Rhode Island? <laughs> <laughs> this is where we got to get the Joe Rogan guy in the background that comes back. We're like, actually, it's this big. <laughs> Sage, get your phone, yeah, get your yeah, phone yeah, out. Start looking things so up. <laughs> so it's a ton of dirt. And, you know, they didn't want to do geotech or get any data up front. So we went ahead and graded it. Said, here you go. You know, this is what we can do. And then they, you know, started excavating. And they figured out there's a huge layer of shale. Can't dig there unless you blast it, right? Dynamite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they did use that for utilities, but you know it wasn't going to be efficient to blow up the whole side of the mountain, right? So would've what we cool. it would have been cool. Instagram would have blown up. <laughs> no pun intended on that one. <laughs> so How about those views. <laughs> what we ended up doing was basically regrading the side a bit. We saw okay, there's good dirt over here. Let's go ahead and cut more over here, fill more over here, and. Um, we were able to balance it out as so we go. So you shifted that project. Yeah. Uh, and so you, there's a little bit of redesign involved. Yep. So yeah. we go back to you. So if you run into something like that or whoever's doing that work runs into that problem, you just have to go back to you and yeah. tell you what happened and you fix it. Yeah. And then, That's and then the goal. they drive their tractors around and do what you told them to do again. Yeah. Unless they decide they're going to do their own shade tree solution, mm-hmm. at which point down the road, you would have bad information on that site because you would be using the original versus this abbreviated or, or amended. So the excavator doesn't go back to us and we can't go back to you and yeah, we fixed it. Yeah. Now you go back and the sewer line is like two feet deep instead of three feet deep or the whatever the. So the gas line on that, on what you're, what you're talking about um, on this particular project unknown would be that the gas line um, is actually, not where it needs to be. It's it's two feet. It's supposed to be a three foot. It's eighteen at, inches. It, right. It's two feet above and where it needs twelve to be. inches is where the gas line is. Water's about it. Oh, that's actually a good question. Yeah. So the water line is uh, at two, which is not good. Uh, two or three feet? No, it's three feet. Water line was at three feet. It was supposed to be a four. So um, and none of that was actually located. So the excavator kind of. So and, and it's tough because gotcha. the the data was bad, yep. and you know phone got marked, but three feet away it was another phone line. Yep. So and, bad and data assumptions, in, right? And assumptions happen. were made, right? And everybody knows that assumptions. We all know what that spells, right? More than once we've heard the reference of P and Z, like that's planning and zoning. And you guys have heard us talk about land use, and that's that's can be changed, but that's usually already set up inside of your city's design of like this is R one, R two, R three, I one, I two. BZ, like business and commercial and all of these various zonings, and that's part of the PZ process of making sure that your land can be used for what you're hoping to develop there, right? Yeah, or your PUD. As, as we've said, dirt is not dirt. <laughs> dirt is not dirt. And so a lot is yeah, not a yeah. lot. Like a, a sink is not a sink. That's just not how it is. It's not exactly how it is. It's not quite so simple, unfortunately. But that's that's part of us helping like people go, well, where the hell would I start? Me? G, the GIS, find the parcel that you're interested in, figure out what it's zoned for, and go, okay, am I the developer or do I need to find a developer? Because um, he's going to go, I need a civil, I need a survey, I need a lot line, I need the lots laid out, cool. You hand a lot to a GC with an architect with a print, you're pretty much, and, and a geo, you're pretty much ready for a building. I mean, it's super simplified because at that point, uh, the infrastructure's in the ground. So if you come into a standard subdivision, mm-hmm. your civil's done, by and large. Yeah. You oh, should yeah. have you should have fucking gas and water and sewer, and that should be there. If you're coming to a purely native ground in the middle of nowhere, um, and you're going to be the developer, you've got to you know you got to move that starting block back. Yeah. You know, two three guys. So do you help coordinate? All that, or does that go back to the the GC or the developer? So let's say there's a subdivision you design, or doesn't even matter, RV park or a PUD mobile home park. You design all the stuff that's in the dirt, 
do you help coordinate that with all those people? Or does it go back to the, the GC who then gets a hold of Black Hills Energy and, and Amos and whoever It depends else on how the, the owner wants to do it. You okay. know, I mean, I really enjoy working with people. There's a lot of smart people out there. Mm-hmm. So I like being able to, you know, if the developer may choose to have the GC run the show, they may have us to, run, you know, do all the coordination. And usually we are coordinating with Black Hills and Source Gas and, um, all those different utilities to make sure we get all of that right. Um, but if the owner wants us to, we'll also coordinate and um, do all the coordination with the contractor and line them out, or we'll do all the coordination with all the other subs like surveyors and geotech and all that. It really depends on how the developer or owner wants to do it. Mm-hmm. So we're happy to. Wears, so everybody wears more than one hat. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm just wondering Especially for, in a small town, too. I mean, yeah. Fair enough. that's part of it. I'm yeah. also wondering for, like, efficiency's sake. You know, if you've got a GC that's already working on four projects, if you can go, you can coordinate the infrastructure getting put in the ground mm-hmm. um, yeah. and, and your firm handles that, then that would lighten the load on the GC. Yep. So you can do that. Yeah. So we can't. You can do that yeah. to coordinate all that stuff? Yep. We've exhausted any of the questions that I was going to be able to ask. Other than, of course, when we shut these off, I have a quick question for you on an actual project. <laughs> Sweet. Um, yeah, which is, <laughs> I know you guys are, and, and, and that's the other thing, too. Last thing I'm going to say. I did all my questions on air. Last thing I'm going to say is. <laughs> I last, only go on the record. Last Remember, thing I'm going to say Rage? is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, call Wyatt. Y- you call police and EMT in case of emergencies. All of us right now are too busy. You know, it's going to take a while. Like, I mean, I mean this because so many times people get a hold of you and they're like, yeah, I want it done tomorrow. And it's like, dude, we're booked six, seven, eight, ten, twelve months sometimes out, especially if like a, the GC pulls up a big house. You're not going to see them for if it's depending on the size of their outfit. Yeah. You're not going to see them for months. So if you're planning a project, what did you say the other day? It's no matter what. It's a fucking year, maybe two years. <laughs> Barna said that. Uh, he didn't say it on the air like I just did, but he's like, this stuff takes longer than anybody thinks. And that's because people are busy. It, it, and I think that was, that's, that's, that was an answer to Alex's question from a while back, a couple of weeks ago. It's like, how many things are you guys working on? <laughs> oh. We'll see which one works. Like, yeah. we're working on all of them because I know one of them is going to be two years. Mm-hmm. I think just the negotiations are going to be six months just for land and zoning and just, just that part. Yeah. Like, the money part and the, the zoning. We're not even talking about laying anything out yet. <laughs> We're just seeing we? if it's even possible to do it. Any of these negotiations, any of these conversations can fall apart. Yeah. And then you're there like, well, I was working on that one thing for the last two years. It didn't work out. Hope, then what? Hopefully yeah. you right? had more than one other iron warning, warming in the near, near or in the fire, right? And so you can, you can always take them out and let them cool off and let them put a pin in them later. But if you put all of your stock into one egg in that basket and that thing fucking doesn't work out, you're hosed, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. Well, and then you're back to the emergency call thing, which which is <laughs> which is real. And, but oh, it's yeah. one of those things. And, and a lot of guys. It's like, tough. Like like the plumber. I talked to him. He's like, ah, I just booked into, into July. So just put me on the schedule for a, three days to a week. I don't care. I'll figure out what we're doing then or, or between now yeah. and then. There's no way I won't need you. And be waiting for you in July. Yeah, in July. I, yeah. I was on a schedule for my house. I'm like, no, put it towards our project. Right. You know, it's like yeah. I don't, I don't need the water purifier, whatever the hell it was. Like, I don't yeah. need the reverse <laughs> osmosis system in my house. Right. I need the backflow preventer installed. Yeah. At, you know. Yeah. At our project. And that's the thing where it's like, if you're thinking about doing something, you need to, you need to let the trades guys know, and it needs to be months in advance, more than likely. Like that's just the reality of it. This work takes time. You guys have to sit and do your calculations and get your data and collect everything. This ain't going to happen at the snap of a finger. Yeah. Oh, I definitely. won't get back to you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> tough, man, because you get people calling you with all kinds of emergencies, and, you know, you try to help everybody you can. And yep. It's just like, oh, man, it's, you know, wish we had more time to help more people. And that's – We're that's working on it. So is that the sign-off? I mean, you're, you're hiring, so your, your firm is growing yeah. considerably. How many people do you have now? Um, there's six of us now, um, hopefully seven in the next couple of weeks, just put out an offer letter and then we're looking for two more. So if you know any drafters or civil engineers that want to live in an amazing place, it's amazing. This place is unreal. It yeah. is awesome. Sun, uh, awesome people like Barton, Wyatt. 
cool people. I don't know about awesome, but I mean, we're yeah, here. We're all right. <laughs> Mainly Sage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mainly Mainly Sage. Sage. yeah. But we're here anyway. We're people. And, um, well, we don't do anything. Like, this is, this is it. We, we literally just work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. it. But um, <laughs> it's like, you want to go get, get dinner? What? No, I don't have time. I like to eat standing up so I can get back to work. <laughs> I wish I were joking. I, I, I eat while I'm working. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I know, right? So with that, um, we want to thank you for your time. Thank you for what Definitely. you do. Thanks for the opportunity. You guys that, are doing awesome. Absolutely. We're going to keep moving forward. We'll keep building projects. Um, and our new sign-off is going to be, um, don't call us, we'll call you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're busy. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, but, do, but do listen. Uh, do follow along. Do ask questions. Do get a hold of us on our, our various um, Facebook pages, Instagram pages, websites. Um, you can find us. Uh, click the link. Ask a question. Maybe we'll are, get are you doing my job now? Oh, that's coming next. Follow us, like us, uh, share, and subscribe. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or wherever you uh, consume your podcast. <laughs>